Of course, a huge question on everyone's mind is, should schools be reopening in the U.S., given that the pandemic is still ongoing and many places still have rapidly rising case counts? Around about 20 states are in what I'll call the red zone, where they have ongoing outbreaks that are not under good control. You have a smaller proportion of states that have the outbreak somewhat under control or they're trending towards a low reproduction rate of the virus, which is a metric known as r not, which is written R and then the character zero. And this simply describes on average how many people a single infected person will pass on the virus to. And when you get that r not value below one, that means that each infected person is infecting fewer than one person on average, which would drive down case counts overall. And that indicates that case counts are generally more under control in areas where the R not is low as compared to higher. So given all that data, experts agree that most of the US where these case counts are continuing to increase where the R not value is high are not ready to open schools because they do not have good control of their coronavirus cases within the community. They don't have a good control of that viral spread. So you cannot, given the community that the school exists within, it is very difficult to control spread within schools if you don't have control of the wider community in that respect. As of yet, within the US, more than 200,000 children have tested positive for the coronavirus. We do find generally as a trend that children have been less likely to catch the virus and tend to have, at a population level, milder disease. Now this would not be true if you zero in on individual children. Some children do have very severe reactions to the virus, so that's not a blanket statement. That's simply a population level trend that I'm describing there. For instance, about 300 children or so within the US have developed a multi-system inflammatory syndrome in response to the coronavirus. And this is a very severe illness and should not be taken lightly. So keep all that in mind. And in addition, immunocompromised children or any with pre-existing medical conditions, particularly diabetes, could be at risk of fair, fairly severe infection. Um, so not to discount those children in this discussion at all. It may be though, that children are slightly less influential compared to adults at spreading the virus to new people. So an infected child may be less likely to pass on the virus to another person is what I mean by that. And it may be partially because children actually have a lower density of ACE2 receptors, which is what the virus plugs into to infect cells. They have a lower density of those receptors in their nasal cavity, which is where typically the virus first takes hold. So if there's fewer of those receptors, there may be a slightly lower chance that the virus can even jumpstart an infection in the first place and may slightly explain why children seem less likely to number one, catch the disease, but number two, pass it on to others once they do catch it. But that's highly theoretical and we're still very much looking into what this disease really looks like in children, given that especially during lockdown, you would expect that mostly adults are moving about in the world. Adults are the ones who might still have to go to work. They're the ones who go to buy groceries, go about you know, normal everyday activities, whereas children can more easily be isolated at home for extended periods of time. So the data that we have on children so far may be slightly skewed, given the fact that in most places, schools have been shut down. That said, I know some of you will be popping up in the comments to remind me that in some places, schools did reopen without dramatic spikes. What's going on there? So in Norway and Denmark, they opened schools for younger students. So um, starting with primary school age children, and they did not experience a spike in cases following, but they also had strict social distancing measures in place within the schools and took other precautions. So it's not as if school was back to normal. It was very much a pandemic situation where perhaps deaths have been spaced apart. Uh, it's been suggested that rather than having students rotate classrooms, if that's something that's happening in your school, that the teachers instead rotate classrooms to minimize movement, all that sort of thing, and rigorous sanitation policies, things of this nature. So Norway and Denmark have been fairly successful at reopening some schools. 
However, in Israel, we saw a different trend. We saw that they initially opened schools for younger children and they found some success. They didn't see a spike. So then they opened schools more broadly for older children as well uh, into middle school and high school age. And they did see spikes in cases among students, staff and teachers. And this was mostly attributed, at least half of those cases were coming from the middle school, high school age group. So this kind of hints at a broader trend which a study from South Korea bolsters and found that children between the ages of 10 and 19 were about just as likely as adults infected with coronavirus to transmit the, the disease to others. So while younger children appear to have a lower chance of passing on the illness, it seems that once you pass the age of 10 and getting into the teenage years especially, that that risk just continues to mount and the disease the possibility of transmission grows with age. So keep all that in mind when we're talking about different age groups going back to school. Now, in places where the virus is relatively under control, is it safe to open schools there? There are a few requirements at baseline to make it as safe as possible. There's never an elimination of risk, but if you get regular and frequent testing with quick turnaround times for results among all the students and staff, that's a great, especially on college campuses, for instance, where you're talking about adult populations. Um, that's key to getting people back because then you can conduct thorough contact tracing, at least within those communities specifically, meaning that you can reach out to all potentially exposed contacts of infected people and get them all to self-isolate before they continue to spread the virus among their classmates and teachers and other staff at the school. Um, you want to see a less than 1% positive test rate within a community if you want the best results of opening schools. So that would indicate that less than 1% of diagnostic tests given for COVID-19 come back positive from within that population. So that indicates a very low rate of spread, which is a positive thing. Those are really the key points, but on top of that, the same social distancing measures that I mentioned before. So limiting class sizes could be especially important. Um, considering more opportunities for teaching class outside could be an option for some places. Obviously it's not very sustainable as soon as it starts raining, et cetera. Um, having, again, teachers move about from classroom to classroom instead of moving groups of students around so much and also spacing out the desks and above all, mandatory mask wearing for everyone. And of course, especially with younger children, this can be a great challenge because as we all know, when you're wearing a mask for long periods of time, you, you wanna adjust it, you wanna touch it. We see this among adults. So to expect a six-year-old to maintain good mask wearing all day long is, is a tall ask. When schools inevitably do open, we're going to learn more and more about how safe that decision really was. But just to reiterate the point, in places where community spread is not under control, opening schools is not considered a safe option right now.